Hello and welcome to our next installment of the 2020 series of Notre Dame Shakespeare Festival online offerings, Fee Fi Fo Wood with Scott Gerwitz. Scott is a longtime artist of the Notre Dame Shakespeare Festival, and I'm, I'm really genuinely thrilled that our audiences finally get a chance to meet him, that you finally get a chance to meet him. You don't need to have the material Scott uh, uses in this uh, episode in order to be able to follow along. Um, though you might want to adopt the techniques if you're ever uh, <laughs> charged with uh, putting together your own theatrical production uh, that involves these kind of, uh, of scenic needs. Scott's been the charge artist, which is scenic artist, for uh, a particularly notable television show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, as well as the Steppenwolf Theater Company, in addition to the Notre Dame Shakespeare Festival. You can find out more about him if you look up his uh, mural painting company, which is called Morpheus Painting. And in the meantime, I certainly hope that you enjoy this class featuring Scott Gerwitz. Thanks very much. See you next time. And go. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Gerwitz. I'm a uh, scenic artist in Chicago. So uh, today we're going to do a little uh, paint demo on uh, uh, making some wood. So fee, fi, fo, wood. Fo, wood is a uh, uh, French word for fake. Um, so yeah, so uh, I am the scenic artist at uh, Shakespeare at Notre Dame. Um, my first show there was uh, The Comedy of Errors. I believe that was 12 years ago. Um, and, and I will say, I'll give them a little, uh, a little bump here, but it is my favorite company to work for. They are um, really appreciative of all the artists that come to work for the company and really take a part in like knowing who everyone is and telling them how much they appreciate you, uh, which is really grateful. Um, especially the scenic artists, you usually don't get to see a lot of the administration or the, uh, the artistic staff. Um, so luckily at Notre Dame, we were all are in the same building. Uh, it's most places I work, um, we're in a shop like way on the other side of the city, so you don't get to meet a lot of the other people. Um, but it's a great company. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see, a little bit of my background. I uh, studied at Brandeis University uh, in Boston and got a master's degree in scenic art and then moved to Chicago in, um, around 1997. So I've been here ever since. I uh, worked at Steppenwolf Theater for about 10 years. Um, I've actually never had a full-time job. So I've always freelanced, uh, which my father was a man who, uh, you know, he worked full-time somewhere always. So uh, he always thinks that's kind of funny that I never had a full-time job. Um, then uh, worked through a bunch of other places for a while. I was the uh, head lead painter at the Oprah Winfrey Show. Um, and then uh, I'm now, uh, charge artist at the Court Theater, and at, um, a couple years ago, I joined the board for the Guild of Scenic Artists. Uh, I'm the treasurer. So it's a uh, nonprofit trade association for scenic artists. Uh, we kind of try to create community. Uh, luckily, I'm in Chicago, so I get to work with a lot of other painters, but very often a painter is by themselves at a university or at a small theater in the middle of nowhere, so you don't get to really talk and hang out with other people. So we're trying to create this community. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, so, all right, uh, what is a scenic artist? So some of you may not know what that is. So uh, basically we're a painter. Um, we take over after the carpenters finish building the scenery uh, to create whatever the paint treatment of the show is supposed to be. Um, kind of a, a definition of a scenic artist is a professional artisan who creates representational surface decoration on a large scale or architectural services. So you can tell I don't say that very often. <laughs> it's a little awkward. Um, but a scenic artist can work in theater, obviously, uh, television, movies, uh, amusement parks, uh, restaurants, um, anywhere that something needs a little more than just kind of a flat coat of paint. Though we do also do flat, uh, flat painting as well. Um, so today I'm gonna take you through some, uh, some painting some wood. So I decided to step you through the process of me making some samples. Um, so when I get a design from the set designer, it's my job to figure out how to implement, implement the set designer's vision of the play. Um, so they'll give me uh, different elevations, and I have a couple pictures of the ones that we're gonna work from today, um, that will give me the idea of what they're looking for. And then it's really important to speak with the designer to figure out why they made these decisions, where they're coming from, what does the play mean to them um, visually, because uh, there's only so much information that an elevation can give you. So an elevation is typically like 
it, you know, it's a printed two dimensional image of what they want. And, you know, they're usually only about this big. But the scenery obviously is huge. So there's only, you know, we're not a photocopier. Uh, we need to add things to it that the designer necessarily couldn't in the small scale. So we need to figure out uh, what it is that they want to add to that and uh, how it uh, goes with the show. So uh, the set designer at Notre, uh, Shakespeare Notre Dame is uh, Marcus Stevens. Um, he's got a great way of, I really enjoy working with him because he has a great way of, of kind of explaining what the, the play, like sometimes, like, so a lot of times we don't read the scripts, you know, we don't tell everyone that. Um, so he's got a great way of like, well, with Shakespeare, I mean, obviously most of the time I've read all of those at some point, um, but he has a great way of uh, talking about the script and how it relates to the, the environment that they're creating with the director and the other artistic staff. Um, so he's a, a great way of uh, uh, really helping me know why they made the decisions they did and helps me create uh, uh, hopefully a better end product for uh, the production at the end. So uh, let's see, the first one we're gonna talk about is The Tempest, which we did a few years ago. Um, let me, okay, I'm gonna share a screen here and show some paint elevations. Uh, 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 here we go. Okay, play from start. Here we go. Okay, so this is a model piece for um, the boat that was on stage. It was enormous. Uh, actors could, uh, characters could walk on top of it. They could walk in through that little hole. Um, so it was the idea of the Tempest, the boat gets beached on, on this little island that, you know, no one really knows what this is. Um, so it's, it's been there for a long time. It's old, it's aged, it's distressed. Here we go, here's uh, the full model. Um, so the floor was painted kind of a, this kind of like topography of like water and beach and uh, that was really fun to paint. Uh, let's see, and then here's some production photos. Uh, as you can see how large that boat is now that you get some actors on there. Um, and then uh, another close up there. So this is the first demo we're gonna do and then I'm gonna show the second demo is going to be what we were going to paint this summer, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Marcus, uh, he hadn't finished the full design yet, um, but this is kind of his original ideas of where he was kind of going with it. Uh, something he said uh, is, uh, let's see, the main thrust was to be a fantastic natural bending of man-made convention, love, marriage, etc. I sort of landed on a softer boho chic wedding look garland, soft worn wood, bulbs. And then in this next one, this is an interesting idea for a floor. Uh, the gym floor is an attempt to see how nature bends the journey of humans. Um, so I'm excited to see what this set is. Uh, it's gonna be, if the, the floor is actually gonna be that, it's gonna be challenging for actors to work on that. So that'll be some fun movement work on there. So, okay, I'm gonna jump back and talk a little more specifically about the wood. So the wood on this boat um, is extremely distressed, really worn away, kind of, you know, the water, the ocean water has worn it down. So we wanna create a lot of depth into that wood. Um, so for that sample, we're gonna do a subtractive type of uh, wood treatment where we take away material to create the depth. And then in this one, I kind of, the on the left side, uh, that where you see a lot of the roof, I kind of keyed into on um, the wood that's in there. So we're not, there's not as much depth, but we want to make sure we can see some aging and some uh, uh, wood grain and kind of a little more. And again, it's not as worn, so it's like kind of a beautiful space. And uh, we are going to, I'm going to stop sharing there. All right. We're now going to join Scott down in the studio and uh, we'll let him take it away from here. Hello, welcome to the studio. So we're gonna start our first sample for the wood of the Tempest. Uh, the, the wood that was on the boat that was beached, uh, that was aged, had been there for many, many years. Um, uh, this is going to be a subtractive uh, process where we're going to take away, subtract material. Um, the sample we would do for Midsummer is going to be an additive. Uh, we'll add some texture to create the, uh, the, 
the, the faux look of wood. Um, here we go. So this is how the boat was built. Um, uh, they built a, a rib kind of plywood construction and then all of the boards were made out of this uh, pink insulation foam which you can get from a hardware store, Home, De uh, uh, Home Depot kind of place. Um, here we go. I've cut it into about a three inch wide. Here we go. I'm going to draw in some really big gouges into the wood using a box cutter. Always make sure you're cutting away from yourself. Don't cut yourself. All right, take one out there. Do the same. Cut away from yourself. All right, perfect. Okay, now I'm gonna use a wire brush to basically just dig into this foam. Um, it's pretty messy, so I'm gonna put my PPE, now that everyone knows that it knows what that is, personal protective equipment, my mask. That goes along great with my COVID hairstyle. All right, here we go. This is a tiring process. It is a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. The amount of depth you get in it. There we go. It almost takes a couple passes to start to like really be able to dig in. We're almost there. Yeah. Check that out. All right. I think we're there. guys a chance to look at it now see all that depth that we've created in there while it is it extremely a lot of labor to do this um, totally pays off in the end um, the when the lighting casts around it let's see if you can see some of the shadows that happen in there it's pretty beautiful um, give credit to Jeff Shimanowski who's the one who uh, did almost all of the carving on that boat so uh, his forearms and his biceps uh, <laughs> probably huge for after that show um, all right, so uh, we've done the carving part. The next step, we're going to coat this with a uh, product to uh, protect, because the pink foam is pretty, it's not very strong, uh, so we need something that will uh, make it a little stronger for it can take a little abuse from the actors and uh, get applied a little better, um, and we'll take paint well. And uh, we'll do that in our next step. Thanks. All right, now we're going to coat our pink foam. Uh, I'm going to use a product called Jacksan 600. It's made by a company called Jacksan Coatings. Um, they, it's an industrial product used for roofs, uh, like especially flat roofs. Uh, so they slather that on top of a roof to keep out the rain and weather. Um, so it takes abuse. It's uh, it's very flexible, so it expands and contrasts with the uh, with the weather, the sun, if you need it. Um, and it works great for theater applications. Um, now, uh, other coatings you could use, um, or that I would not suggest use on foam, is like uh, joint compound. Uh, it's a very brittle uh, kind of plaster, you know, the stuff they use on uh, drywall. Um, it uh, cracks very easily, where this stuff is going to be able to take the abuse a little better. Um, so, all right, here we go. So, uh, I've put a little bit of black tint in it, uh, a little black paint, uh, just to make it kind of gray, so I'm not working with white. There we go. Um, so you don't want this stuff on your hands. Um, 
and we're just gonna slather it in there. Remember when you were back in elementary school finger painting? The same thing. So I want to squeeze it in there to get inside all of the cracks and crannies. Nooks and crannies, cracks and crannies. Is there a difference? I don't know. There we go. Getting it in there. So I want to get the edges too. So I want to be able to paint the sides too. So it's one complete finished piece. Okay, now I've slathered it on and I've lost a lot of my detail on it. So we want to pull some of that back out set this aside. So I'm going to use this brush here and I'm going to just drag it through. And what it's going to do, it's going to take excess out of the cracks. Uh, there it is there. So as you're doing a lot of this, I'll save this stuff. Like I'll take it out, put that back in so I can use it for the next piece. Um, all right, so we're seeing more detail, but now so you can see some like kind of uh, boogers on there. Uh, those are kind of ugly. And since this is kind of a rubbery material, it's not sandable. So after it's dried, those little boogers will stay on there. So we want to get rid of them. All right, so uh, I wet a brush and I just very lightly push through because I don't want to like push it through because that got rid of a lot of the nice little texture that has happened there. Let's bring that back. If you can see how much better that looks. Okay, just a little drag on top. Pop, pop, pop. All right, uh, we're gonna let that dry. Thanks. All right, so it has dried. I let it dry overnight. Doesn't seem like it took that long, did it? It's only been a few seconds to you. And I've made up a uh, nice base coat. I took some uh, flat paint, flat white paint. Just a hardware star paint, added a little bit of raw sienna to make a, to give it a little bit, almost like a, this piece of wood. So it's a pretty similar color. So I'm using that as the base coat. So I'm now going to paint the wood. Call me Huck Finn. Oh no, it was Tom Sawyer, wasn't it? Alright, here we go. Painting, painting, painting. All right, you really want to make sure you get into all the little crooks and crannies I talked about earlier so you can really see some spots in there. Uh, here's an interesting term. So all those little kind of gray spots you can see in there, those are called holidays. When a painter is working, another painter may say to him, uh, uh, watch your holidays. It's an old term for uh, the painter wasn't paying attention to their job, they were thinking about their holiday. So, cheesy little term, but it's useful. Paint all the edges for this happy board, the Bob Ross style. This came from a happy tree. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's stupid. <laughs> All right, here we go. Almost done. Now, production-wise, when Jeff did this, he used a roller. Paint roller is going to be much faster for this job. But I'm only doing this little thing, so I don't want to get a roller dirty. Almost there. All right, beautiful. Checking for my holidays. Now we're gonna wait, paint, uh, watch paint dry.
Our base coat finally dried. That took a while. So I have mixed up three colors. They're going to start to give me the idea of the, the wood of the boat. We have kind of a, a burnt umber kind of color. A raw sienna-ish and then a raw umber. So this raw sienna has a little bit of white paint in it. And white paint tends to get a little chalky if you're glazing it with other colors. Like if I was to add white to this burnt umber, it would start to turn into a pink color. And we want to stay away from that. So what I'm going to do is I want some of this kind of this warmth sienna color to be underneath kind of like the, the, the depth of the wood. So I'm going to do a first pass of that raw sienna. Okay, I got a little uh, spray mister. Add some water there. Got a little container water. Don't need these here. I'm just going to use my raw sienna color. Here we go. Let's see. Dip a little water. Take some paint. So I've thinned the paint down. You can probably see how easily it's dripping down there. So it's pretty thin. Put a little bit. Uh, I like working on trays because it releases too much paint that's in the bristles. And I'm going to keep this paint in the center area of this wood. So I want the edges of it uh, in the end to get pretty dark. So now I'm going to come back with a bigger brush just with some water and glaze it through. Kind of even it out, make sure I get into the holidays. And I'm going to wrap the edge a little bit. Let's get this signed. Ba, ba, ba. All right, it's a good first pass. Now it's the fun work. This is a lot faster in terms of labor, how much time we spent on just carving the wood versus the painting. The painting is always pretty surprising how quickly it goes. So we're going to let that dry and uh, we'll start back with the next colors. All right, we're in the home stretch now. So this is what the sienna looks like dried. Now we're going to add the burnt umberish color and the raw umber. Again, I'm going to moisten it with some water. Okay, well this feels a little thick. I'm going to thin it down. All right, here we go. Glazy, glazy. Yeah, let's see if I can do this so you can see it a little better. Do it this way. Okay, I've got that. Now I'm treating this raw umber as a much darker color. So it's going to get give a little shaping to the board. A little more in there. There we go. Let's get the edges. All right, don't forget about the ends. Got this end. Okay, all right, now I'm gonna grab the water brush and blend them together. Uh, what do we think of that? That looks a little, it's a little strong on the edges. So I'm gonna wipe some off. It's not so dark there. Set that aside. I'm going to add more water to thin the paint out. You know what? I want some more burnt umber in the middle there. the color just look I'm afraid it's gonna dry a little dark again if I thought it was dark I don't want to add white at this point because it's gonna get chalky so what we're gonna do at the end here is we're gonna do a little dry brush of some white to give it a little more weathering and um, it's just about there all right all right what I think is gonna be the last step 
Now when I say I think, I never really know exactly what's going to happen. I do something, I think I know what it's going to do. Sometimes I get surprised. All right, here we go. Okay, I'm scared. Look how bright this color is. So I take a little white, uh, put some raw umber in it. So kind of makes it a little off-white. Here we go. You know what, I better grab that rag again. Here I am, just in case I hate it. Here we go. Of course, if I hate it, I'm just gonna stop the recording and re-record, aren't I? But let's not do that. Oh yeah, look at that, look at that, look at that. Yeah, I'll do it this way. There, what's that? That's pretty good. Get the edges. Let's not forget about the edges. Tone this off stage side. Up, up, up. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's good. All right, I didn't have to re-record the video. That's awesome. How about that? So, here's one of 10,000 miles of wood that we would endure that Jeff made for The Tempest. All right. Thanks, Scott. Down in the studio. Um, oh, I'm a dork. All right. Uh, so we'll take a little break. Uh, does anyone have any questions from uh, the first step? Yeah. Uh, Scott, it looked like Justin's, uh, Justin had a question. Justin, or if your vi uh, video and uh, microphone are on, uh, aren't on, please go ahead and enable them. And then uh, when I ask your question, it was a really good one. Uh, yeah, Scott, I was just wondering, uh, when you were applying that snow coat material, why did you use your fingers rather than like a brush or other applicator? Um, I think with, with, the, with the hands, um, you can kind of dig. Like, I guess when I'm applying it, I'm actually not just rubbing it. I'm kind of pushing it down inside the little cracks. Or like if I used a brush, it would almost be like just using a trowel. And, and, and at that point, it's just like filling in all of the things. All of the texture so when I come back with that the rough kind of uh, brushy thing to pull the excess out it would have to pull out a lot more um, and um, and it's fun <laughs> I also like brushy thing <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Great. I'm gonna ask one while I also tell all of the other students um, who are are with us in the in the zoom call to please feel free to raise a hand or, or toss a question to the chat, or just go ahead and, and open up your camera while we take this pause for questions. We'll do another one at the end of the, uh, the, end of the video, of course. But uh, my question for you was, um, I, if, you, if you mentioned the types of paint, uh, we certainly heard the colors, but the, the types of paint, I missed it, I apologize. And I, I wanted to ask that of you. Is it a latex base, the, oh, yeah. is it an oil base? Can you talk us through that a little bit? Sure, uh, typically for theater, we use a, uh, um, uh, at Notre Dame, we buy uh, Roscoe theater paint. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a vinyl acrylic paint. Um, it's got a lot of pigment in it. Um, so it's uh, really pure and it's easy to thin it down. Like if you, if you go to a, a box store and have them mix like a dark brown, there's, you know, let's say you got a gallon, there's maybe this much pigment and then the rest is, you know, the acrylic, the latex, whatever's in there. And the Roscoe paint, I mean, they probably, half of it is actually just pigment. Um, so you can thin it down and turn it into watercolor. Um, so a one gallon container will, after you thin it down, maybe be worth five gallons of paint or whatever. Um, and you can also use it thick as well. Um, but um, it, it's a preferable way to, uh, I, I, I prefer using those colors because they're much purer. So it's almost like as if you were to go to the art store and buy, you know, like fancy acrylic paint. So it's kind of uh, equivalent. And there's, there's a few different theater supplier paints in the country. Cool. I'm always thinking about the cleanup. You know, do I need paint thinner? <laughs> this sets oh, yeah. No, I, I try and stay away from oil-based paint as much as possible. Um, in the next video, I sneak in a little thing on some faux wood that I actually did use some oil. Um, uh, but you get into lots of safety issues um, that, especially in theater, there's not time for oil to, to dry. Like theater, scenic artists, you get to paint as fast as you can. You have so little time, time crunch, uh, you gotta move it going. And if you have to wait for oil paint to dry, it's a pain. Um, yeah, and it's not good for the environment. So the less we can use oil, the better. 
that was a nifty segue, but I think we have time for one more real quick. I've got a question from Max. Stuart, okay. want to pop on and ask your question, Max? Hey, Scott. Um, just looking at the uh, process that went into painting just that one small little segment of faux wood, I'm just wondering how many man hours went into the creation of just the exterior of the Tempest boat? Seems Jeff, like more Jeff than you questions? can count. Yeah. Great question. Um, a lot. Uh, I think I, I luckily I was not involved in building that part of the boat or <laughs> doing all that wood. Um, my job on that show is I mostly focus on the floor. So as I mentioned, Jeff uh, did the bulk of it. So um, he probably did a couple weeks of carving that wood. Um, yeah, and the, the team stuff. helping him, Jeff leading the process and doing a lot, certainly lion's share. Um, but uh, Jeff is typically with us each summer for anywhere from a month to a month and a half. So uh, that was that was a that was a fun task. Also, uh, Scott, and you might touch on this because the boards bent, and not just you know in one way to show the curvature of the boat, but it was down toward you know in two directions because of course you were we were we were going toward the prow of the boat. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Like my zoom illustration there. Um, so did that require anything special of the uh, the foam painting or the or the, or the the texturing just in, as you recall it? I'm pretty sure they used uh, the the foam that I used in the studio was I believe uh, maybe it was an inch and a half piece. I think they used maybe an, an inch and maybe even sometime I don't know, I doubt they went down to half inch, but the thinner it is, the easier it was for it to bend and turn like that. Um, I had to build a boat once. Uh, my wife is a public artist, so I always get kind of involved to help. She says she marries me to paint her work because uh, <laughs> she's a sculptor. I'm the painter. I should paint her stuff for her. Um, so I helped her build a boat one time, and we were building it out of, like, Luan boards. And, boy, to get that that curve to go like that and then back down, oh, it was, I think we ended up, like, cutting chamfers in it. Yeah, it was a pain. But, mm. So uh, the foam gives you the ability to, to wrap it around and down the Cool. Well, there was a nice segue there into faux wood on uh, on a midsummer anticipation uh, of the de of the design, and so uh, I think we'll go ahead and shift to that next. And All folks, right. please do keep track of your questions as we're going, and I can uh, highlight you and, and ask you to to pose them of uh, of Scott here uh, on the other side. All right, awesome. We're going to join Scott back down in the studio. We're now going to work on the samples for Midsummer Night's Dream. The show that unfortunately we're not doing this summer, uh, we'll do next summer. The designer Stephen Marcus, uh, Marcus Stevens, sorry, uh, had not totally finished his design, but I showed you some pictures of some of his research images of where he was thinking of going with the set. So there's going to be a bunch of wood planks throughout the uh, scenery somewhere, kind of aged, worn away, uh, but not as aged as the boat Tempest would. So we want something that's not quite uh, distressed quite as far, but we certainly want something that's got enough texture that it'll read from a distance and give it kind of a, a nice aged patina. So uh, we will uh, use some strips of uh, plywood, or uh, this is actually called Luan. It's a quarter inch material. And uh, this is the additive process. So the product I'm gonna use is called Super 88. We could use the jack sand that we used on the Tempest wood, but for just to kind of shake things up a little bit, we're going to use a different product. It is a food product adhesive. It comes from a company called Abbott Adhesives uh, in Chicago. It's actually used to glue like cereal box lids. That's the glue for it. So again, uh, just like jack sand, it's very rubbery, holds up really well. Um, it's a bit more expensive than the jack sand but it's a little thinner. Uh, Jackson has a little bit of grit or aggregate inside of it. This is completely smooth, so you could thin it out really thin if you really want. But we're gonna use it right out of the bucket. The tools we're gonna use are some, some uh, wood, grainer, wood grainer tools. I have a bunch of different kinds here, and each one of these little details that's on there is gonna give you a different type of wood, so we'll play with those. And this is another kind, which will give you more of a straight grain. So that's one thing when you're doing fa uh, faux wood, you don't want everything to have wood, uh, the hard grains. 
Because like if you look in a, uh, in a nice library or wood anywhere, basically, uh, wood floor, not the, the hard grain isn't everywhere. So it's hard grain with some straight grain. So it's a nice variation. Da, 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 da. Okay, I want to make sure I get texture over the entire surface because it's going to look weird if there's a mist. Uh, we talked about that in the last videos, a uh, holiday. The rocker tool will work uh, work a little awkwardly if you have holidays in your texture before you wipe away. All right, let's try this one. Okay, oh, this will be interesting. So this tool is shorter than this piece of wood. So that's where I'm going to start working into this. So let's pull this guy across. Ah, that one's nice. All right. Now, as you can see there, and I'll turn it so the lighting can give you a shot of it there. So my rocker tool was not as wide as the wood here. So this tool's got nice variation. So it starts with, it's got a little big teeth over here, works this way to small, big teeth works this way to small. So the, the space in between the wood grain here on the end there is pretty wide. So I'm going to take one of the wide ones, pull that through. Look at that. Look at that. Nice. All right. And then this one, I'm just going to do only the straight grain. So I'm going to follow what I say. Don't hard grain everything. Now you're going to want to hard grain everything because it's so cool. But in the end, it won't look right. It'll look too busy. The material I took out here is a little wet. There we go. Okay, I'm going to remove some of that. Now let's start this way. I'm going to start with this side. Pulling away. Okay, now look how much material that took away. Again, like I talked earlier, save that material. Okay, so we started with a pool, the, the large teeth over here, and it works this way to small. So when I do a second pass here, I don't want to use a big tooth again, because here, I'll do this. Ba, 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 ba. See, it looks weird. That's not how wood works. So a nice thing about this material, it's got a long dry time. So I can press that back down. So I'm going to start with the small teeth against there. Boom! Nice straight grain. This texture is similar to Jack Sand. It is not sandable. So I am going to clean off the edges here. Great. Uh, this stuff does take a while to dry, so we will come back after that dries. Thanks. We're going to do one extra sample here that has nothing to do with either the Tempest or Midsummer. Uh, when I was doing the rocker tool on here with the texture, I had a feeling that it was probably a little difficult to see it through the camera. So I decided we're going to do a little extra wood finish one. So I based it, this is going to be kind of a strong mahogany color. Based it this nice strong orange. This paint's a lot thicker than what I was using on the wood for the Tempest. There we go. So hopefully be able to see this really well. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. That looks awesome. All right. Okay, I'll lean up a little bit here. Now we talked about the size of the teeth over here. I'm going to go with the bigger teeth on the end. So I didn't really like what happened down there at the bottom. So I'm just going to do another pass. All right, that's pretty good. And I'm going to flip it. 
Okay, so I don't really like that, but I know when I remove again, it's going to kind of hide it. There we go. It's a good start, good under layer. We'll let that dry. We'll do a little kind of a glazing on top, and we'll be good. Thanks. So this has had a chance to dry overnight. Uh, it took a while to dry because it was pretty thick. So uh, here we go. We're going to apply the next coat. Again, like I talked about at one point, just want an even coverage of this one. I like to think of when I'm doing process like this, like the base coat is the raw wood. The, the grain, pull grain, is like creating the wood. And now I'm kind of staining the wood. It's a pretty strong under layer, so I'm going to make it a little darker of a wood, a little heavier. Again, always going with the wood grain. There we go. I think that's good, right? Yeah. Alright, so you could work on this forever to get the perfect strike. There you go. Yeah, it's a good process of just using the wood rocker tools with some paint. No texture. And we're back. Okay, so I went ahead and base coated these so you guys don't have to watch me apply a base coat. It's pretty boring. And we're going to use the same colors that we had with the other wood. Similar process. I'm going to use the paint a little thicker than when I did on the other one. So here, let me lift this so you guys can see it a little better. So I'm applying a little bit there. Same thing, this is going to be an under undercoat. Back and forth. Now this finish is a little slicker because it doesn't have all the, the crooks and crannies. Boy, I'm going to say that forever now. Um, that kind of settles itself into, well, that's right here, settles itself into the cracks. So you don't have to worry so much about brush strokes. Here, like if I did that and that dried, that looked pretty terrible. So we want to make sure that we're always going with the wood grain. There we go. So the Sienna's had a chance to dry. It's looked pretty good. It's a good start. There we go. Again, very similar to what we did with the Tempest wood. Get a little water on them. Got some of the burnt umber color. Some of the raw umber. Here we go. Got a lot of water in that brush. in the umber to get a little shaping or the raw umber color this is my darker value Make sure there's no holidays all right yeah this look great Oh, I got a fingerprint in that. All right, and then our next step is going to be a little white dry brush, like we did here, but um, a lot lighter because this is a, a not quite as aged as we talked about with that wood. Let's let that dry. This glaze coat is finally dried. Feels good. All right, we're going to do uh, the same white with a little raw umber. Okay, it's drastic. I'm nervous again. So you know what, I'm going to take even a little bit more off this. Because if I went too heavy with that, it wasn't a big deal because it's pretty aged wood. This one is much more delicate of a wood. So here we go. Let's try not to mess this up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's catching just the tops 
of the texture there. So when I'm dry brushing, I'm actually using kind of this part of the brush. I'm not using the tips. I'm using right in there. Because if I'm just using the tips, let's see if we can see it on the back. Well, of course, you can't see it at all. So here, I'll do it on one of the other ones. What happens with just the tips? See how like rough that looks? We don't like that. See it a little better? Okay, going on. And look how light I'm holding it. So like I'm barely touching it. Just letting it work. It's but work it's the weight of it of its the brush itself is doing the work. Well, it's starting to dry, it's a little light. I'm gonna go a little further with it. Because we are painting for theater. So you gotta remember that you're painting for like 50 feet away. The closest audience member is not gonna be right on top of it. So you need to be a little more dramatic. You're painting. How do we do this? How's this look? Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. All right, so we are now done. Let's figure out a way to let you see all of these next to each other. Up, up, up. Next to this. So it's same color, same colors, but obviously much different effects. Super aged, kind of a um, beautifully aged, let's put it that way, on these. Here we go. Thanks. It's fun to see that put together. I, I was uh, I just rec uh, recollecting that the darker piece that you did um, early on, the sort of stain, the darker stain, if you will, um, and I'll get the, I might get the, yeah, the paint colors wrong, might have been the burnt. Um, okay. I, uh, and any, uh, Anybody with sharp eyes in the audience watching this who's a, been a fan of the Shakespeare Festival may have spotted uh, a, a look they would recognize from a notable production in 2012 of Shakespeare's Hamlet, directed by David Bell. Uh, that was definitely uh, a color and a texture of wood that we saw a lot of on a great big stage uh, that provided lots of sliding doors uh, um, for uh, multiple entrances and, and, uh, and side lighting. I just noticed that and went, oh, hey. Oh, well, that's why I chose it, because I remembered that from so many years ago. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course you did, of course you did. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, at the moment, I, I don't have questions from any of the participants moving forward at, okay. at the moment. Uh, and so, you want to, are you going to wrap, are you wrapping with this? That's, that's, oh, as far yeah. as we take it. Do you have more stuff to share with us? Um, and oh, forgive me for not. Yeah. Two different wood samples. Oh, oh, I see Allison has a question. No, that's great. I love the Bob Ross um, <laughs> yeah. uh, reference. My son has Bob Ross socks, so it's got happy oh, little yeah, tree, nice. and it's got you know it's got the big curly hair, right? Um, and the happy little tree phrase. And everyone who sees those socks, yeah, goes, "Hey, I used to watch that too." You know, everyone yeah, of a certain yeah. age, shall we say, Allison? Yeah. So, Allison so one of the things I'm always curious about when I see like faux finishes especially wood is like the if there's like a magic formula for picking the colors that go into it because I, I assume you don't want to get things that are too coordinated because then it doesn't look as natural but how do you determine what colors you're including in a faux wood uh okay so the the dark wood sample like the kind of the mahogany um that one i cheated and i have a book that um <laughs> is like how to do faux finishes so in it, they actually spec like Benjamin Moore color XXX, you know. So for those, so there are, there are places you can go for like that because like mahogany is all kind of basically the same idea. Um, uh, so it can pre buy that stuff. But when you're when you're when you're trying to make it like when I was trying to make the other stuff, you just you have to play. You have to figure out what works well. Like you look at the research and figure out you know like how warm or cool is it. Um, and uh, lots of samples. Like I, I did samples before the samples I did in the video to make sure all of my colors worked pretty good. Because a, um, a lot of times, like maybe the the because your 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 heart uh, the the wood grain color needs to be a more intense color because it's under a couple layers there. So those typically need to be a little darker. So I know in my, in my samples that I originally did, it was too light. It was like after I glazed the next the burnt umber and raw umber, the green kind of went away. I'm like, oh, well, I got to make that stronger. So, 
um, samples. Gotcha. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, Scott, about, thank you, Allison, very much. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit, Scott, about um, zooming out, haha, -ha. um, when you're going from sample pieces to a very long individual board uh, or boards that are going to be then affixed up into, uh, in, you know, into something like the boat, um, I wonder about, uh, I've seen it you know, of course, walking through the studio. But I want to how do I paint something that long and that all laid out on the floor? Uh, because, of course, the brush is here, right? And then also, what do we use to apply them to a, to a, a vertical structure? Once, you know, once the surface is so intricately covered, you don't want to throw a nail through it. Yeah. Um, so you broke up a little bit. So your question is, how are we doing it in larger scale? Yeah, in other words, literally, what's it like in the studio uh, in order to uh, execute those larger pieces? Um, and any kind of way you want to you sure. in interpret that question. Um, and then what, what do we use to get it up on the surface? Um, so one thing to think of when I talked about uh, scenic artists need to work fast. So you're always trying to figure out what is the, I always joke that I'm lazy. I always want to find the easiest way to do the job. Um, <laughs> So in a case like that, when we were painting all the boards for the boat, we just laid them all out on the floor. We got big brushes, like they sell brushes, like, you know, you see in the hardware store, they're like little three inch brushes. We have like six inch brushes, eight inch brushes. You put those on an extension pole or a, a bamboo stick. Um, and uh, yeah, you get a big Hudson sprayer, like a garden sprayer. Instead of a little mister, it, it'll spray a lot of the water. Uh, you got little carry trays you can carry around stage with all your colors. Um, and you just, you work. And, and also when you like, especially with those boards, you can eat, you can have like two people working on each board. So if the board's like 10 feet long, let's say, you can each start from one side and work your way to the center. So it's going to uh, work you a little faster. Um, as far as applying the stuff, um, that, that was, I don't remember exactly how they did that. It was... I know there was like uh, like a what do you call it liquid liquid nails um, would go on so they they built this plywood structure of the boat so it had like all these little you know each each four feet it was another layer of ribbing I guess that's what they're called yep. um, and I'm not quite sure because I wasn't there when they actually installed it but I imagine they needed something more than just the glue especially when you got to start pointing it down so. I bet you they still use screws. I bet you they were screws in there because we have the benefit of it being theater. It's 50 feet away and it's so aged and there's so much texture going on that no one's really gonna notice those screws. You think that that screw is gonna be easier to get through it, say, than a staple gun uh, on a new yeah, the, problem, the problem with a staple gun, because the pink foam is so not strong, like it's just like cushy, uh, the staple's just gonna go like right through it. Yeah, so it could pop itself out. Where the the um, the screw is a little wider. They may actually have even like uh, use uh, washers on the screw to make it just a little bigger. And um, that that does sound familiar. I do recall some combination of, of liquid adhesive and yeah. and structural. So that's yeah. that's pretty cool. Well, hey, uh, Scott Gerwitz, thank you very much for doing this. Um, oh, we have more question, incredible. In incredible production staff that the audience doesn't just doesn't get a chance to meet. Yeah. Um, and you know, if there's the hashtag silver linings, um, is, uh, is getting pretty popular out there, uh, in, uh, in social media. And this is certainly, this is certainly one of them is pointing out an opportunity to get to know some of those folks uh, that have been with us for, uh, you know, a, a, a big chunk of years. Um, because of course you started so young, and um, <laughs> uh, I think that's really, really cool. It's, uh, so I, we'll see if we can't keep a feature like this, uh, you know, continuing even when we are already through the forest, uh, you know. That's the, the theme that we chose for this season. Did not, we didn't intend for it to be quite so prophetic. And I noticed that you're in front of one. <laughs> it's really, really cool. So through the forest have we gone or yeah. are we going, certainly. Um, so we're going to look forward to uh, bringing audiences through the magical wood outside Athens uh next summer and uh, very much looking forward to having you back with us at, uh, at that point and hopefully you know uh, the chance to converse you know between then and now as well so thank you again for joining us on yeah, awesome that's fun online offerings cool take care
All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.